Welcome to Now Church. We are about to begin. Please take this opportunity to pull out your smartphone so you can like, share, and check in on our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please use the hashtag NowChurch. Thank you, and enjoy today's service.
are etched in my heart today. Here we go. One, two, three, hey! Put your hands together. Lord, 
dry ground to speak to barren lands of oh God we can speak your word and believe and believe I prophesy to the lowly places a healing flow to the broken I see it coming back to life. I see it coming back to life. I see it coming back to life. We're gonna see it rise up. Gonna see it rise up. Gonna see it rise. Yeah. I prophesy over every family. The prodigal will come rush. I see it coming back to life. I see it coming back to life. I see it coming back to life. Yeah. We're gonna see it rise up. Gonna see it rise up. Gonna see it rise. Sing with me, one voice. Say, so Holy Spirit.
Today we want to minister to so many different, maybe different directions, but one of the directions we want to focus on is this weekend is this time of just honoring veterans and those that have served in our country. And so this is a time where we need to really honor and appreciate. We believe that there is a, there is a attitude of honor in this house. And so we just want to thank all of you for those of you and I know some of you don't like to be put on the spot, but this is the, the, the right moment. Those of you that served our country in any of the armed forces, I want you to raise your hand where you are and just wave so we see you. Keep your hands waving. Come on. That's awesome. That is awesome. Thank you. Now. With your hands raised, we want to do something different because we've got a, a prayer that Pastor Gail found, and I just feel like it's powerful for us to just pray this over you. But for those of you that are family members of those that raised their hand, I want you to raise your hand, family, whole families that served. There you go. See, moms, dads, brothers, sisters, we realize that there is a price paid by you as well, right? So... Let's go ahead and just, I want to pray this prayer. If you just agree with me right now over their lives. Father, we thank you for the courageous men and women who have served in the United States Armed Forces. We acknowledge that America is still a land of the free because of brave veterans. And we thank you for the families of our veterans who selflessly served at home while their loved ones are in harm's way. As the Bible instructs, we give honor to those whom honor is due, and we esteem their service and sacrifice on this Veterans Day. Lord, bless these families. Bless them abundantly for sacrifice. And Father, thank you, Lord, for a rich reward on their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give God praise. That's really cool. Thank you. And that means a lot. I'm seeing Chris tear it up, and he's getting me close to tearing up. I just have so, such a high respect for those that have given their life and given their service or time. So I tell you what, one of the things I want to pray for as well, too, we have a special challenge. You know, if you've been around this church, you've heard about a three-week challenge. We have a very special assignment for you. It's an end-of-the-year challenge. And it's this. We want you to pray and, and allow God to put somebody, one person, in your heart, in your life. We'll do it in a second, too, to just to show you how we're going to be doing this. But when God drops that person in your heart, we want you to exercise your faith and be praying for them regularly that the Spirit of God would start working on their heart. And we want you to, after you have prayed, after you have prayed and allowed God to move, we want you to Believe God for a conversation, an invitation to bring them to now church before the end of the year. Okay? So right now, just close your eyes where you are. We're going to show you how. This is very simple. Looking for someone who is disconnected from God in his house. Someone who needs this atmosphere, needs this relationship with God. So just close your eyes right now. Let's believe God that he would just drop it in your heart right now. Spirit of God, we just ask you, reveal to us. Just even a face might pop up right now in your heart. Might be a friend, might be someone, your coworker, a relative, next door neighbor. Maybe it's a clerk that you talk with regularly, retail, a server that you've regularly seen. Lord, we pray that you reveal it. Show us who you want us to reach out to and begin the work of your spirit because you said no one draws 
anyone to Jesus is that the Spirit of God draw them. And Lord, we ask you that you would put in our lives, cross our paths with those that need you to come into your house. In Jesus' name. Okay, if you got that, now if you didn't get it, pray again. But if you got that person, start praying for them regularly. And this is our task, end of the year challenge that we're going to be doing, okay? Is this good? Because we're going to be able to celebrate lives changed here, right? That's going to be awesome. All right, I want you to turn around and find somebody to write a church with and welcome them to Now Church. We'll continue in a minute. It's good to see everybody here. I'm going to jump right in to our In the Know segment. We've been switching things up and just giving you some In the Know of things that are coming up rather than things that have just happened. So a few of the things that we wanted to bring and highlight to to make sure you know what has taken place. Again, our couples weekend is coming up in just a few weeks. And so that's here. Make sure you know you can register right here with the QR code. You can go back in the back and register as well too. This is for the couples weekend coming up December 1st and 2nd. Special guest speakers, Pastor Chad and Julie Braswell includes a beautiful dinner I've been told on Friday night, and then also coffee and snacks on Saturday as we come back for our Saturday morning presentation. It's going to be amazing, but make sure you register as soon as possible. This helps us to be able to plan better and get everybody in. And also tonight, now use holiday movie night. It's here at the giant screen right behind me. It's going to be 6 to 8 p.m. Free admission. Just bring some money for fresh popcorn, movie snacks and sodas. It's more than just watching a movie. They're saying they want to gather together to have some fun. So it's going to be a good time. And if you're a youth interested in being a part of our Christmas production, come early at 5 p.m. tonight. Okay? Just want to make sure that you guys got all of that. If you're newer to Now Church, please go by our guest experience uh, our counter over there in Legacy Building. We've got some stuff we want to bless you with and thank you for coming to Now Church. And as I said before, we always challenge you. It was the end of the year challenge. We also have three week challenges. Check out Now Church three weeks in a row and see what God does. We believe we've seen it over and over as people are giving focus time to God. He really starts speaking and pouring into their lives. Now here's the thing. If you were through three week challenge, you're like, Man, I love this church. I'm ready to just get on board. Tell me how, tell me when. Well, we've got liftoff. Our last liftoff class is coming up next Sunday at 11 a.m. So if you're looking to find what does this mean for membership, I want to get involved. I want to help people and serve in this church. That is your next step is a liftoff. So that's happening 11 o'clock next Sunday. We don't want you to miss it, all right? So right now, I want you to help us in welcoming Pastor Richard as he continues on this series. Sir, praise God. Well, thank you for being here today. It's going to be a great day. And thank you for those of you who prayed for me when, we were, when I was away in Lincoln, Nebraska last week. Uh, I blew my voice out on Friday night. Uh, and by Sunday morning, um, it was just supernatural what happened. I was just, I was still able to preach. My voice was a little bit tired and raspy, but uh, anyway, so I'm using the handheld right now uh, for first service just to make sure there's no uh, little residue or anything, but I feel good. I'm healed. I'm whole, and thank you for praying for me. Uh, a couple of things real quick before I get into my time, and that is um, prayer school part two is this Wednesday. I want to thank those of you who came out this past Wednesday. This week, well, we've been talking for a long time. Uh, one of the things that I teach in Bible colleges all over the world, I teach a course on the authority of the believer. Um, and the authority we have as believers in Jesus' name. And um, I'm going to be teaching that this, this Wednesday night. It's one of those things I wish I could do on a Sunday morning, but it's so, it's, it's, it's so vast and we have... Such a variety of people coming in. we got brand new people coming in on Sunday mornings, and that's a good thing. <clears throat> always want to be mindful of new people coming in. They may not have the same background or the same depth yet of what uh, God wants to do in them. 
And so we just try to be sensitive to that as well. But if you can be here this Wednesday night, uh, those of you, um, I didn't get to send anything to, to my, uh, I have a uh, small group of young couples myself, and I want to encourage all of y'all to be here this Wednesday uh, as part of our discipleship and what we're doing in my small group, okay? Also, Pastor Chris wanted me to, just, we had a good talk the other day. He wanted me to let you know just how much um, God moved last week in Lincoln. It's been a great thing to have this flow of the Holy Spirit here lately. We just want God to do whatever he wants to do. We're not trying to manufacture anything, but it was really cool because in Lincoln, God showed up in ways that they had never seen before, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So maybe you're newer here to Now Church. Whatever God wants to do today, we're just going to ride that wave. If it's in the Bible, we believe it. And, uh, and so some people get uncomfortable with it. Well, why did that happen? What that? <clears throat> well, that we don't try to figure it out with our heads. We try to ride the wave with our hearts and let God be God. And so I, uh, uh, I just want you to know, everything we try to do is biblically based. Uh, there, there was such clarity last week. Uh, I could tell you a dozen stories, but uh, one of the funnier ones is that during, we had, I had three services there, and they do an 8.30, a 10 a.m., and an 11.30. Wow. It was, uh, it was wild and woolly. But uh, one of the second service, I think it was, there was a young man sitting over on this side of their service, and uh, he was second row, and he was just really checked out during worship. He wasn't, he wasn't in there at all. He was physically in the room and spiritually out to lunch. And he was not engaged. He was just kind of looking around. And, and so I felt like God wanted me to minister to him. So I get up, and in the middle of the message, also I look over, and his chair is empty. And for some reason, I just stopped the service for a second and said, hey, what happened to that guy that was sitting right there? And uh, they go, oh, well, uh, I said, did he leave? Did he leave? Because he was checked out. Anyway. I didn't say he was checked out. Anyway. But I said, did he, did he leave? They said, no, no, he went to the bathroom. I said, oh, well, now we've outed it to, in front of everybody. He's went to the bathroom. I said, don't anybody, you know, laugh at him when he comes back in or anything else or see if there's toilet paper on the bottom of his shoe or anything. But anyway, so he came back in, and I kind of left him alone. And then the Holy Spirit said, now. And so I just, okay, so I said, I said, young man, look, I just, I just was calling for you a few minutes ago, had him stand up, and I just prayed for him. I didn't have him come up or anything else. I just extended my hand toward him, prayed for him, and, um, and, and, the, and he just looked at me blankly for about the first 40, it seemed like, it was probably 40 seconds, it felt like four minutes, because it was this long, and he's not, he's not into what I'm saying at all, uh, it appears, and I just felt like, okay, I'm being obedient to what God said to do. And so uh, Pastor Matt and Kerry Erickson's oldest son, Cooper, was my armor bearer for the weekend. And he's uh, 20 years old now, great young man. And I just said, Cooper, I said, I said, the young man, what's your name? He said, Connor. I said, Cooper, go minister to Connor. So Cooper ran over there. And he, next thing I know, this young guy just breaks into tears, puts his hands in front of his face, and he starts sobbing uncontrollably. And I just was so thankful that I took the moment to minister because God knows where people are and we try to read them out. We read the book by its cover, right? People do that. And so if I had read the book by the cover, I would have just, I would have walked away when he was just standing there. But when, for some reason, when, when Cooper went over to actually touch him, to actually pray for him, the power of God moved in this way suddenly and this guy was just broken before the presence of God. There was stuff like that the whole weekend. And uh, it was the, the Friday night leaders meeting was where I was praying for, uh, I, I was ministering to about 60, 60 or 65 uh, team captains and leaders of all the departments. And um, I preached them the same message I preached here last time, two Sundays ago on the code, you know, the Navajo code talkers, you know. Yep. And I was sharing that with leaders. And um, all I can tell you is the power of God hit the place like, like a bomb went off. And people were just laid out all over the room, whether I touched them or didn't touch them. And some people, like the people in the back were like wide-eyed and kind of nervous. By the end of the service, we, we, I spoke for 45 minutes, 
And then I ministered in 15 minutes, and then I sat down. And then Pastor Matt said, the presence of God is here so strong. We're going to dismiss you if you want to go, but you can stay if you want to stay. We're going to get Pastor Richard to maybe minister a little while longer. Well, two hours later, nobody had left. <laughs> nobody had left. And finally, the people in the front who had all been ministered to, they were kind of to the side, and some were finally going to pick up their kids. And the skeptics that were kind of hanging in the back, kind of just watching, they boom, came up to the front <laughs> toward the end, and then, then another bomb went off. And even the skeptics were just really excited about what God was doing. So thank you for praying for me. I understand now why Paul the Apostle said, pray for me for boldness. Because what happens is, if you look at people's faces, you're never going to minister properly. you got to hear from God, and you can't be worried about what anybody else thinks, what anybody else says. That's so why I just say, I point you to the Word of God. If it ain't in the Word, we don't believe it. But if it's in there, we're not going to believe it. We're going to trust God, and we're going to activate it. Okay? And there's, there are some things in the vintage wine that's in, in this old bottle right here. Uh, there's some things in this vintage wine that I've been more concerned for, for many years at times in the back of my head with what people think than what God wants to do. And that has been shaken off since Cuba. And I am free, and I'm not going back. And I hope you enjoy the ride. But if you don't, as long as God and I enjoy the ride, it's going to be good, okay? Anyway, so open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 16, <clears throat> and we're going to start with the message, then I'll go into the New King James, another verse. All right, uh, Matthew 16, Jesus connected with his disciples about showing his true identity. Remember that? He said, uh, who, do, who are people saying that I am? And then they said, well, some people think you're you know, Elijah, some people think you're John the Baptist, some people think you're this, that, the other. And Jesus kind of keyed into the disciples and said, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon looks at him and he said, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus acknowledges that he didn't get that from textbooks. He didn't get that from education. He got that from God the Father. He got it from, from God himself. Matthew 16, 18 it says this, so Jesus said to him, and now I'm going to tell you who you really are. So who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. He said, okay, and now I'm going to tell you who you are, who you really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy. Put a pin in that right there because we're going to come back to it. I put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom, keys to open any and every door. No more barriers between heaven and earth, earth and heaven. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven, and a no on earth is a no in heaven. I love that. Now I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Familiar passage to many people here. But when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. <clears throat> Pardon me. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You know, I want to remind you what Jesus saw, what he said in the scattering. Remember, Pastor Lindsay started our new series last week called Gather. And it was a masterful opening, by the way. Pastor Lindsay laid it out there, gave me a great foundation on which to build for the month. <clears throat> Very powerful. But I want you to realize in this passage, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus said the harvest is huge. It's plentiful. It's the labors are few. For some reason... Like, like I'm talking about the power of boldness to, to believe and trust God. We believe in our modern times often that there's a lack of interest. That if I was to pray for somebody uh, and, and invite them to church, that they wouldn't come or they wouldn't be interested. Or maybe they, maybe they came before and they didn't have a, maybe they were closed off. Or maybe they said they'd come, they didn't show up, whatever else. 
We start to overthink things and overprocess people in our own hearts and minds because we start saying, well, they're not interested. The Bible doesn't say we have an interest problem. The Bible says we have a labor shortage. We have a shortage of people who just simply believe God, love people, and are willing to gather them in. We got to believe God. We've got to trust Him. We got to believe. Let's pray one more time. God, would you open the eyes of our heart today to take hold of your promises and your purposes? We look to you as we gather in your in your new house, in your house right here, as we gather together, Lord. We're believing you to come and do whatever you want to do. Show us who you are and show us who we are in you. In Jesus' name, amen. The word gather, very powerful word, uh, not only in English, but a very powerful word in the Greek. We'll talk about it in, in a few moments. But you might think, um, I, by the way, when I saw the graphic from the graphics department last week, a week and a half ago, I thought PL is going to make fun <laughs> of this graphic because there's no black folks in this picture. And I knew it right away, and I thought, well, they don't, you know, when I heard them say it last week, I said back to the screen, I said, well, they don't look like my people either. <laughs> I knew you were going to be funny about that. I knew, this, I knew you were going to make a joke out of it. But anyway, <clears throat> um, this theme is not just about the holidays. I want to drive that point home. It, yes, we have Thanksgiving in a week and a half. That's crazy. We have Thanksgiving in a week and a half. But that's not what this theme is about. I believe the word gather is a prophetic thought right now about what God's been saying. If you remember the first month of the year, our theme in January for this year, the overarching theme for the year was Harvest time. Harvest time. When I was flying over um, Iowa about to land in Omaha, Nebraska, I looked out and uh, I usually have an aisle seat. For some reason, I had a window seat from Atlanta on. And I was looking out and, and getting to see the terrain, which I hardly ever get to see. And I saw harvest fields all over Iowa and Nebraska. Just flying in there, I was like, oh my goodness, that's right. The, the, Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving holiday was because it was harvest time, and it was their first harvest of the pilgrims seeking after God. After they made it through a rough winter, they were able to plant, and this was their first harvest, and they wanted to, they wanted to dedicate it to God and say, God, this is, this is because of you. You helped us to break through. You helped us to live. You helped us to survive. And now we have harvest. Well, I want to tell you, it's harvest time in the kingdom right now. If you believe like I do that, that there's a lot of things going on in the world that you can't explain, it's not time to be afraid, but it is time to be concerned about other people who don't know Jesus. It's time to, to lift our eyes unto the fields and see that they are ripe unto harvest. And understand that part of the gathering is gathering them in. Pastor Lindsay defined gather as to come or bring together, to assemble or accumulate, to take in from scattered places or sources. That's why I read that scripture. Jesus saw them weary and scattered, like sheep without a shepherd. Taken in from scattered places or sources. Assemble one's thoughts to gather yourself. Emotions, gather your strength for a purpose, to gather, a person gathers himself. I want you to know, in this loneliness epidemic right now, the greatest loneliness people are feeling, even in crowds, is if they don't have a real relationship with God. If they don't have a real relationship with God <clears throat> through Jesus Christ in a great way. So we have to understand, the harvest is plentiful, but laborers have to be gatherers. And part of gathering is inviting people. You know, I, 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 statistically, I read something just a few months ago once again that there's a great percentage of unsaved, unchurched people in America that said and responded favorably that if somebody would simply invite them to a church that was alive and that they could come and meet some people and they would come be with them, that they would come, that they would come and, and, and check it out. 
That's, that, that is statistically something that's there. The problem is we, we switch it off in our brains because we go, well, that person doesn't look interested. Well, that kid that I ministered to, Connor, last Sunday, I don't know, I hope he's back in church today in Lincoln. But the, last Sunday, he didn't look interested even when I'm ministering to him and he's in church. But then God got a hold of him, see. What did it take for God to get a hold of you? Because I'll tell you what, I was, I was pretty stubborn myself. I, 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 I didn't want to go to some dead church. I was, I was frustrated with, with, I was raised in traditional religion all my life. And at 19, I, I still had not really heard the gospel that I knew. And suddenly, when I was, I remember my aunt's words to me, just cry out to Jesus when you get in trouble, when you get in a situation, just call upon the name of the Lord. Because whoever calls upon the name of the Lord would be saved. I didn't know that was Romans 10. But it's in the word of God. And when I cried out to him, he revealed himself to me. Now, as you know, I, I have a real grace to travel. I love it. Even the, the flights, the airports, the craziness most of the time, not all the time. But there's something that I love more than all my travels, and that is coming home. And that's the theme of today. That's the message title for today. Coming home. Ever say home? How many know there's a difference between a house and a home? I don't know if you've gone through the legacy building this morning coming through uh, to, the, to the auditorium, but um, we've had some busy people the last few weeks decorating and getting things in order in there. And, you know, it, it's been a house since we dedicated it in August, but it's becoming a home. It's becoming a home. And so there are welcoming spaces there. Wait till the cafe opens in a few months. It's going to be even more. Home is the place I long for when I'm away. Home is, I love the atmosphere of home, the atmosphere of safety and security. I, you know, in, at home, I'm loved and accepted and so are you. At home, you're loved and accepted even in your pajamas, you know. You don't, have to, you don't have to wear fancy clothes or anything else. You just, you're, just, you're just accepted in your skivvies, you know. You're just accepted just in your big old, I, I, I don't know much, I like a big old nightshirt, you know. I wear a big old nightshirt, and, and, and I, I just love just being comfortable. Part of home is comfort. You're accepted, you're loved, and you're not having to pretend anything. You, when you're not having company over, you just relax, you're just there. And I'm telling you, home is like a little taste of heaven on earth, isn't it? Now, I realize that's not everybody's home in every season of life. But God's ideal is that your home is more than your castle. Your home is your home. Your home is your place where you can just be yourself. You can relax. You can, you, you're accepted. You don't have to strive to be anything. And that's one of the things I'm supposed to talk about today. Coming home to the Father's house. Church is supposed to be Papa's house. It's a place where you're coming back and you're gathering together around his presence, around Papa, around the Father God. I get a little bit frustrated with the traditional religious concept of church. The early church was so fully alive and moving in great grace and great power as they had such an intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, look, I'm going to be going away, but I'm sending you. It's better for you that I go away because I'm sending you another comforter, a comforter. To me, the word comforter sounds like a, like a thick blanket, you know. <clears throat> this, um, you know, when I used to go to Iceland a lot back in the 90s and early 2000s, I would go up there and sometimes I'd bring home an Icelandic comforter for my family and, uh, and it just was this nice blanket. I think, it's, I think we wore a few of them out. But uh, it, was so, it was so nice and thick. It was almost too thick for Florida. We had to put our air conditioning way down to use it. <laughs> but it was the, these nice down comforters, you know, it's, it's, good to, you know it's, it's good to get that comfort, that warmth, that feeling. But that's the way it's supposed to be in the presence of God. That's the way it's supposed to be, that warm acceptance that warmth, that, that you, we're good, we're, we're doing good. And that's what the church moved in. They had an intimacy with the Holy Spirit. They were immersed in relationship with Jesus and with each other. That's why Pastor Lindsay began with Acts chapter 2 last week in the life of the early church. They were gathered together because they were learning together, growing together, 
eating together, praying together, sharing together, going to church together. The common thought is they were gathered, not scattered. And what we have right now, when you see the dysfunctionality of the world and places even in our own community, it's where people are scattered and not gathered around his name, gathered around the presence and person and power of the Holy Spirit. They were gathered, not scattered. I like the word, listen, if you think about the word together, it means to gather. To gather, we're better. To gather, we're strong. To gather, when we're here in that same presence, God can do things that he can't do any other place, any other time. Together, therefore, they walk in power. I told you a while back about the knowledge doubling curve. I want to review that real quick. Some of you remember that. I shared with you a couple years ago. But a man named Buckminster Fuller, who was a, a genius, he was the second president of Mensa, the genius society in America. Um, he's, he's, he's gone now. But in his time, um, he invented things. He did many things. But one of the things he studied and came up with a, with a theory called the knowledge doubling curve. In 1982, he realized that all throughout history, that knowledge doubled for the last three or 4,000 years of human existence. Knowledge doubled about every 100 years. So every 100 years, you would have a doubling of what we know as humans, what we understand, what we activate, what we do. <clears throat> knowledge doubling curve, you can look it up. All throughout history, through 1900, about every 100 years, knowledge would double. But by 1945, Buckminster Fuller found that it was only taking 25 years. Knowledge was doubling instead of every 100 years. Knowledge was doubling every 25 years. And it was on this exponential curve, and he began to study it about the future. By the year 2000, knowledge was doubling every 12 hours. Now, that, now, the year 2000 sounds like, for those of us that are older, that sounds like yesterday. But for those that are young, that's like prehistoric times. <laughs> they, they, they don't, okay, if, they were, if you were born after the year 2000, you, you don't even understand certain things about that. And that's cool. That's fine. We're not putting you down for it. But I'm saying to you, we're now 23 years beyond that. Google and AI and what's happened in the internet explosion since the year 2000, knowledge is doubling like this because it was exponential in 2000 whereas every 12 hours and it was every six and every three. Nobody, it, knowledge is increasing so fast right now that you almost can't comprehend how fast it's going. We live in an information age. The problem is we've become head smart and heart dumb. We've become head smart and, and heart dumb. We've substituted information for connection. We have accepted the information age, and that's fine, but the problem is we have become increasingly less connected, and that was, was galvanized in the COVID situation just a couple of years ago. And, and, and how disconnected, how fragmented, how, how, how much we've been away from, uh, we're, we've, we failed to connect with humanity, we failed to connect with God himself. The word says, woe to him who is alone when he falls. Two is better than one, and a threefold cord is almost unbreakable. I was telling my small group last month, what happens is, you know, if, if you take a, you know, a single strand of, uh, of, of string or thread, uh, you can pretty much pull it apart. If, if you intertwine them, it's a little stronger, but you can probably still pull them apart. But if you take that invisible, that little fishing line, and you wrap two threads around the fishing line, and then you go to try to break it, you'll never pull the thing apart. Jesus is that third strand. Jesus is that invisible, 
that, that, that fishing line that enables us to be intertwined together so that nobody can pull us apart when we're going through something, when we're under attack, when the enemy has put his sights on you and trying to take you out. You need to understand, we are, we are better to gather. We are better when we're gathered in his name. There is power that flows, and the enemy has no power against it. Amen. What is church supposed to be? That's what I really want to hit on today, and next, next week we'll go a little bit stronger with what this does. But what is church supposed to be? I believe God is raising his own loving family in his house. I believe church is more than just a once-a-week stopping off point. It's, it's more than just a, a, the, the place we go to. It's more about the vision we gather around and the sense of the presence of God that we are gathered around. God is raising his own loving family in his house. That's a great place to say amen. Do you receive it? you understand it? God, when you're here, God, the Father, is here and he's raising you up. He's doing something to involve you, to reveal to you that you're part of his family. The church is like his living room. We're hanging out in his presence. When Jesus first describes building his church, he uses the Greek word ecclesia. Some people say ecclesia, but I, I heard it taught originally, and that's where I'm standing. Ecclesia, the, like ecclesiastes, the ecclesia. The word ecclesia in the Greek means a gathering together of called out ones to action. It is a place, remember I read you from the, from the message, uh, a church so expansive with energy. There's an, there's an energy to church. It's not just a place you go. I, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, church was where we went. Uh, I thought it was Jesus' funeral every Sunday because we went every week, and there's an organ and a choir, and the, my parents love the choir, and that's great. That's their generation and their thing. Cool with me. That's how they connect with God. Even in their 80s now, they still, they, 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 they live in Ocala now, but they want to be where there's a, a nice old-fashioned choir and an organ. Great. Not a problem at all. But the reality is, for me, in my generation, I... I, I I want. I, mean, I saw that uh, that monstrosity of the organ, and I wanted to be an organ donor. Is what I wanted to be. I want to. I want to donate that. You know, get that thing out of there. We need some guitars. We need. And 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 back then, and when I was growing up in the '60s and '70s, they didn't have too many guitars and drums in church. And I thought to myself, self, um, if 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 I ever uh, would find a way to enjoy a church. It would have to have some music that I could relate to. That's kind of what I felt. And so, uh, you know, when I was first called to minister when I was 22 years old and I went and told my wife, I feel called to be a pastor. She goes, well, you married the wrong girl. <laughs> she said, I don't play the piano and I don't sing in the choir. You know, and that, that was like the definition we thought of what a pastor's wife was even back in those days. Thank God for Pastor Gail. And what she's brought into this, you know, some of you younger ladies, you, you, don't, you listen. The word of God is clear. There are there are women in ministry in throughout the Bible, from from the book of Judges and all the way through the book of Revelation. There are women that were called apostles. There were women that were called prophetesses and prophets. There were women that were pastors and teachers and leaders. There's a couple called Priscilla and Aquila. That, you know, uh, in the Bible, we have something called the law of first mention when you're doing the, when you're doing, uh, understanding the, the whole concept of how the Bible is understood. And you have something called law of first mention, which means the, the order that people are mentioned in, in the Bible is very clear. Well, in the, in, the, uh, in, in the book of Acts, Priscilla and Aquila were great comrades, great people that, that Paul met when he was working a secular job making tents. And, uh, and he, some people think he was nervous because he was too tense, but that's not what it was. He was <laughs> just making sure you're okay. So, so he, was, he was making these tents. He met this, this couple, and she's always mentioned first, Priscilla and Aquila, and they had a church that began at their house, and then they became people that, that ministered to Apollos, 
and Apollos became a pastor uh, in Corinth when Paul left. And so this whole exponential thing. But Priscilla is always mentioned. They're never mentioned apart, and she's always mentioned first. She had more, a little bit more of a preaching gift than her husband did, but they were a good team. But listen, I'm thankful for those days where, that, we, that we have pioneered, but understand that when we, were, when we were 22 years old and looking forward, it didn't look like these things would happen. And I remember I, just, when I was the most surprised when I felt God call me to minister, call me to be a pastor, and I said, God, how can I be a pastor? I hate church. <laughs> that makes no sense to me. And the Lord said, I called you to change it. I called you to change it. Now, that's scary when you're 22 years old. It's scary when you're 62 years old. It's, it's, it's a frightening thing. I called you to change it. Ah, well, what does that mean? Well, it's taken me 40 years to find out, to let it unfold one step at a time and change the way we do church. Well, what I believe it's called to be is that gathering together called out once to action. It is, it's, listen, the word ecclesia was already used to describe a civic center. It was a secular word. It wasn't a, it wasn't a Bible word. The ecclesia was a word in the Greek that used to describe kind of a civic center. It was a place where decisions were made and decrees were proclaimed about was or what was not allowed in the public square. That's what an ecclesia was. And Ecclesia was a place where they said, well, this, we want this in our city, but we don't want that in our city. Wasn't it interesting? The following part is, the, I'll build, on this rock I'll build my church, the gates of hell not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys so that whatever you bind from heaven will be bound on earth. Whatever you, whatever you loose, it'll be loosed. Whatever you permit will be permitted. Whatever you say no to, well, that's the picture of the Ecclesia. The Passion Translation, listen to this, the Passion Translation to this day uses the term legislative assembly for the word ecclesia. Let me read it for you. Matthew 16, 18, the end of it says this. Jesus said, and this rock will be the bedrock foundation on which I will build my church, my legislative assembly, and the power of death will not be able to overpower it. Very strong, isn't it? My legislative assembly. In other words, things we talk about here and things we decide, we decree, things we pray, things we declare, things we believe, things we talk about as a body are things that then begin to affect the community at large. They begin to affect what's going on out there because they're affecting what's happening in here. Are you seeing it? The church is not, we were never designed at its core, it was never intended to be a building with pews, religious symbols, organs, and steeples. That's not what church was supposed to be. That happened through the something we call the dark ages. That it digressed, it devolved, and it became large cathedrals. You know, when I was in Europe a few, uh, a few months ago, you see all these gargoyles and stuff on these old churches. What monstrous looking, hideous things. Well, they believe that they scared away evil spirits. Well, that's not in the Bible. That's more out of totem pole thinking from ancient times and ancient uh, indigenous people groups that had all these, you see almost every culture, they have these scary looking, like totem pole looking things to try to scare away evil spirits. Well, you know how we scare away evil spirits? We say in the name of Jesus, you have no power here. And I want to say that right now. <clears throat> if you came in and you've been having problems sleeping, a lot of times behind that, I mean, there can be natural chemical things going on in your body, different changes, different things happening. But I'm saying to you, the enemy will try to vex your dreams, try to knock you down. I, I, I just take a second right now. If you've been having trouble sleeping and you believe God can heal you, you need a touch from God, to get good sleep, would stand up on your feet right where you are. Didn't plan to do this, so I'm just going to be obedient. Wow. Well, we break insomnia off of you. Everybody stretch your hands toward these people. And I want to pray for those of you on online campus as well. Father, in Jesus' name, we take authority in that precious name above every name over these demonic forces and these things that try to vex people's souls. I come against nightmares. I come against restlessness. 
I come against that restless leg syndrome thing they talk about on TV. I come against every lie of the enemy right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, your word says that you give your beloved sweet sleep, confidence. Lord, I just break that curse of insomnia right now and almost the fear of laying their head on the pillow because they're just going to lay there and be uncomfortable. We say no to that and we release your healing power to adjust everyone's sleep that is standing, whether in the room or whether at home. We speak sweet sleep on you when you're supposed to be sleeping and wide awake strength when you're supposed to be awake. In the name of Jesus, let your body cooperate with your destiny. And we thank you, Lord, for good hours of REM, deep, healing, rejuvenating, refreshing sleep. In Jesus' name. Jonathan, the devil's a liar. I know what you've been seeing when you go to sleep or try to sleep, but that thing is, that's demonic. It's evil and has no power over you or anybody else in the room. You can be seated. Come on, give God praise. He's doing something. We want to hear from you. We want to know. When you have a better night's sleep this week, we want to, we want to stand with you and rejoice because our God is a mighty healer. I've had that thing before where you just you almost don't even want to go to bed because it's like, huh, I can't deal with another tossing and turning night, right? Some people, some of you have been taking medications, all kinds of stuff, and it doesn't help. That's when you know it's evil. That's when it's the demonic. And nothing even over the counter will work. Trust God. Claim his promises. I think there's a promise in Psalm 3, and I want to say there's a promise in Proverbs 3. But somewhere right there, uh, there, there's a great promise. I will lay my head down and my sleep will be sweet. I think that's Psalm 3. 4-8. Four, eight. Four, eight. There we go. Thank you, Miss Irma. Miss Irma's got the address right there. <laughs> Psalm, is it Psalm 4-8? Psalm 4-8. Is it David's Psalm? I laid my head down and my sleep will be sweet. I think that's one, one of those right there. Anyway, look up those promises. Find them because insomnia is in the Bible. But so is the healer. Amen. He gives his beloved sweet sleep. That's what the word promises. If, if you know he loves you, you can rest in that, okay? At its core, church was designed by God for gathering people together in authentic relationships. We don't necessarily come in our pajamas, but we also don't come in our suits and ties anymore as often. As often, I mean, sometimes we do for different events and things. <clears throat> not against them completely. Well, not much. <laughs> I'm not against ties, but I always say, no noose is good news. <laughs> anyway. All right. I'm back. <laughs> it's about public discourse, learning about God and his kingdom, talking with God. And about God, opening and closing kingdom doors with the power that he's given to us. So we're talking about Wednesday night. But that's all the, also the challenge. You show me a whole bunch of imperfect humans doing life together, and I'll show you insecurities rising to the surface, competitiveness, jealousy, and hurt feelings from time to time. Yet the word says we love one another, and that's what shows the world that he's real and that he's alive. Because we love one another even working through different things. This place is filled with imperfect people. If you came, by the way, if you're visiting with us today and you're looking for the perfect church, you just ruined it. <laughs> Why? Because you brought your imperfection into our imperfection. You brought your humanity into our humanity and learned that we're all hypocrites to a certain degree. We all ascribe to a certain level of life and we believe that's ideal, but we're not perfect. We haven't reached it yet, right? For anybody, listen, if you have attained that perfection, that religious perfection, we'd love for you to glow in the dark right now. Turn your, turn your lights on, glow in the dark right now, and float around the room with your angel wings, okay? So we can all see where you are. Anybody flying? No. Nobody flying. You know why? Because... In God's house, we're brothers and sisters, and we've all been through some storms. We've all been through some stuff, 
and we haven't come through perfectly. We've all messed up sometimes, right? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone. So the problem is we get, rec- we get expectations. That every- See, uh, uh, Ed Cole wrote years ago. He wrote, you know what we do is we always judge everybody else by their actions and we judge ourselves by our intentions. <laughs> well, I didn't mean to do that. Well, I didn't mean to say that. Well, that's not what I meant. Okay. We have to have the same standard. Then let's trust that everybody else's motivations are okay. Church is supposed to be a loving, a loving place of interaction where we relax in his presence. Make yourself at home in your father's house. Put your feet up. And I don't mean literally on the, you know, somebody else's chair in front of you. I just mean put your feet up, so to speak. It's about intimacy with God, a camaraderie with others, with other sons and daughters of God that were part of the family, that we're not just servants, we're sons and daughters. We're not just servants, we're sons and daughters. I want you to get this real strong in you. In God's house, you discover your redemptive identity and purpose. In that gathering together of the disciples, Jesus said, who do they say that I am? Well, they say this, that, and the other thing. Okay, but who do you say that I am? When Peter said, when Simon said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's when Jesus said, and you're no longer this guy. You're now Peter. You're a rock. You're a stone. You're a stalwart. You're, you're strong. You're set. You're anchored. You're there. That's how I see you. That's how God sees you. In God's presence, in God's place, in the church is where you start to describe and see how God sees you instead of how you feel. And then as you grab a hold of what he says about you and how he sees you, it changes your life. And suddenly you become secure in who he is and not so worried about what everybody thinks about you. That's the house of God. That's the aim for now, church. That's what we're trying to do here, a place of intimacy and discovering redemptive identity and purpose. Listen, God wants you to start. In, it begins when you, when you start getting secure in you. You can start looking at other people, not for their history, but for their destiny. You can see them for what God's called them to be and not just for what they've already done. You begin to see different potential in people. Then out of genuine connection, We reproduce other sons and daughters. Listen, as Pastor Lindsay brought up last week about the orphan spirit, that orphan mindset, and that's not based on whether you had good parents or didn't have good parents. It's still something we carry if we're disconnected from God as Father. We feel like orphans and we carry that around and we're constantly looking for stuff to fill that hole, to fill that gap inside. You know it as well as I do. The stuff that you tried when you were in the world was trying, you were looking for something that, that only God could satisfy. You were, looking for the, you were looking for the artificial, but you were looking for the real. You know the, the old song, looking for love in all the wrong places? You were looking for God's agape love. You were just looking in the wrong spots. And you were looking for all this affirmation from everybody else and all this stuff that would would make you feel better about yourself. No, but in the house of God, you begin to discover who he is. He sets who who you are, and then you become secure in that. Now you're able to minister to other people. I'm almost done. Primarily two conflicting overarching views of the church. And I want you to get this today because this is true. This is out of the dark ages. We get this vision of church as being a monastery. But God has called it as an embassy. Two different views of church. Monastery or embassy. Historically, those who believe the church is to be a walled-in place of protecting human holiness, self-reflection, self-denial, almost self-affliction. Because we're, our, our, our flesh has got to die and we've got to kill it. Instead of bringing it into the fire of God as a living sacrifice, we're trying to do it religiously in self-righteousness instead of God-righteousness being imputed and imparted as a gift to us. Are you awake today? 
Then there are those of us who see church as an evangelical assembly, embassy, excuse me, an evangelical embassy, a place from which we reach disconnected others and help introduce them to God and his family. That's what we see church as. Listen, Jesus described the church that he's building, he describes it as prevailing over the gates of hell, right? But obviously that implies that the ecclesia is on offense, not on defense. No one has ever been attacked by a gate. Think about it. A gate is a, is a defensive thing to try to keep people out. Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church that I'm building so expansive with energy. Why? Because we're going through right to the very gates of hell to rescue people that are hurting and broken. That's why we're asking you to, to take our end of your challenge and start to look in your heart and see at least one person that you're focused on to pray for every day these next few weeks. Then we've got all kinds of holiday activities. We have a Christmas music presentation on the 17th, is it? 17th of December in the evening. If they won't come any other time, get them to come for that time. That might be the moment that God gets them, that God's touch comes and makes himself real to them. Might be Christmas Eve morning. We're going to have one service on Christmas Eve day because Christmas Eve is a Sunday. This year we know it's a big family time, but we're doing one big combined service on Sunday morning at 10 a.m., if we have to, we'll do an overflow in the legacy building. But we'll bring the people. That might be the day. Listen, even, even we, call, we used to call them CEOs, okay? Christmas, Easter only people. There's some people that will only consider going to church Christmas and Easter. It's usually the traditionally religious people. What if they came into this house instead of the pipe organ and, the, and, and all the traditions and all the shh, God is sleeping. I want to wake him up. What if you brought him into this place where we're praising God and singing, I prophesy. I prophesy to you. My friends, we got to be on offense. Gates are designed to deny access, but Jesus has given us access. We are a gathering together of called out ones to action. The action Storming the gates of hell, rescuing the weary, the scattered, and the scared, and the broken. This is our Father's house, and it's time to come home and get to know him. Get to know his heart, his deep love, his fatherly love for you and for others. Learn to trust him, his word, his voice. His, listen, the word says his sheep. Jesus said his sheep hear his voice and recognize it. They learn to tune in to the voice of the Father, learning to tune into the voice of God and hearing his promises. Get to know his heart today. Get to know his heart. I got one more story and I'm done. I heard the story recently of a young teenage girl who was on a flight with bad turbulence and the plane starts rocking and rolling and all the people, even the flight attendants, you, you, you know it's, a, a, it's bad turbulence when the flight attendants scream out. I've been on some of those. When they start to panic, then you can get a little nervous, right? This young teenage girl was peaceful and calm, just kept reading her book. Finally, somebody looked over and said, young lady, everybody's freaking out here. How are you so peaceful? She said, I got a secret. She said, my father is the pilot. And I've been with him through many storms before, and he can get us through anything. What I want to tell you is when you get into the Father's house and you get to know him, you have a confidence in your papa that even, when you, even if there's some turbulence and you're going through some storms, we've been through some storms before, and he got us through. Dad's the pilot. We're going to be okay because we're at papa's house. Amen. Let's, would you bow your head and close your eyes? It's time to come home. When God is the captain of your plane, you can be confident he'll get you through every storm as well. And I want to say that to you right now. Maybe you're here today and you're going through a storm. Maybe you're watching us online right now. And you're going through a storm in your life and you're wondering how you're going to get through. Maybe somebody got you to come to church today. 
and you didn't even want to come, but you're here. I'm telling you, God's love is here for you. He loves you so much. He loves you more than you realize. It's not just a cliche. He loves you enough to give his son's life for you. But here's the deal. Here's how it works. You've got to say yes to his love. You, if you keep pushing his love away, you can do that. That's your option. You can choose to keep pushing God's love away, or you can choose to open your heart, open your hands, open your arms, and just say, Father, okay. I receive that you love me even if it's hard for me to believe it. I receive it because your word says it and I see it in the price that Jesus paid for me. If you're here today and you're going through something, we want to pray for you right now. Maybe you came in and you've been struggling. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction. I want to challenge you to bring it. Don't hide it in God's house. Bring it to God's house and put it on the table. Put it, put it out on, put it out in. Listen, this is like God's living room right here, okay? We're just hanging out with, with the Father. And we've all had stuff. We all have different bent. This is the moment to just bring it out in your hand and just say, God, you know what it is. You know what I've been struggling with. Nobody's here to embarrass you. Nobody's here to out you. Nobody's here to beat you down. Nobody's here to threaten you with fiery hell. I'm just here to tell you that he loves you and even when you were running away, he was still trying to just draw you back. His arms are open. And he says, come home to me. Come home today. Come home today. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. Change me. And that's a beginning place. That's the beginning of your eyes being opened and your heart coming alive again. Let him touch your life with his presence. Papa God's waiting. Father God is just, he's not one. Listen, I'll talk about this more in a few weeks, but listen to this. He's waiting when you feel like you're not worthy. He's waiting with a royal robe, a signet ring, and a good steak to come to his house for a party and say, my son, my daughter, they were dead but they're alive because they came home. Come home to him. Come home to him today. Run to the Father, fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon, my soul found a friend, so I run to Close your eyes right now. He's here. All into grace. Done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart has found a surgeon. My soul found a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Praise God. presence is here for you right now. This atmosphere is not just for everybody else. It's for you. Right where you are. My friend over here, is it, are you, are you Ishmael? Is that your name? Ishmael? Ishmael? Is that your name? What's your name? What is it? Bow. That's right. You're the Brazilian guy. That's right. That's right. There was another tall guy in here. I just want to make sure I get your name right. Paul, like Paulo, like Sao Paulo. St. Paul, okay. Stand up for a second. 
You've been coming for a while, and I'm just getting to know you. Lift your hands up right where you are. God's got a great plan for your life, pal. You've known it since you were little, but he's really drawing you back. Everybody stretch your hands toward Powell. Father, do a work in this young man. Bring every equipment that he needs. Because of your presence, he's got everything that he needs. In Jesus' name, I just want to verify and agree with you God's got something special for your life. I'm not saying you have to be a pastor or a leader like I am, but I'm telling you, whatever it is, maybe it's even in business, but you're going to be a captain in whatever area, of whatever field God has anointed you. You're going to be a captain of that field, a captain of that field. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you, Paul. Praise God. Amen. <clears throat> All right, ushers, get up. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings real quick. <clears throat> Got a great scripture. Like I said, when I was flying over the heartland, I saw that harvest time, and the Lord gave me this scripture, Ecclesiastes 3, excuse me, Ecclesiastes 11, 3 and 4 from the Amplified. says this, if the clouds are full of rain, if you need an envelope or an I gave card, just let the ushers know right now. <clears throat> if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth, and if a tree falls to the south or the north, and the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. I know these are, seem like basic things, but when the clouds are full of water, it'll rain, and if the tree falls, that's where it's going to lay. Verse 4. He observes the wind and waits for all conditions to be, to be favorable, will not sow. And he regards the clouds will not reap. My friends, if you're waiting for perfect conditions to be a tither or a giver, to go beyond and to be a generous person, you're never going to find the perfect day. What the, 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 the challenge is to step out, no matter what the clouds look like, no matter what your bank account says, whatever else. I'm not saying write a bad check. I'm just saying stop looking at what you don't have and start focusing on what he's given you and take that and do something great with it. And then all of a sudden, the next thing will be unlocked and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. But it starts with you, not... Listen, every, every harvest starts with a seed, not a harvest. Every harvest starts with a seed. And every farmer's got a plant in faith. Right now, we're going to worship God with tithes and offerings. And I challenge you right now to trust Him. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your generosity. But let's believe God. Father, thank you. Lord, I speak and I prophesy abundance of harvest for the seeds that have been sown, not only today, but all this year as we've been looking at this year as a year of harvest. I thank you the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers have been few and far between. But right now you're raising up laborers to go into the fields and reap the harvest financially, reap the harvest of souls, reap the harvest of lives, reap the harvest of supernatural power, reap the harvest, reap the harvest, reap the harvest, reap the harvest. In Jesus' name, reap the harvest. And I send you now as laborers to go get it. Let your hands be blessed this week for gifts and surprises, having bills supernaturally paid off, having help from the Father in everything you need financially. In Jesus' name, let it be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for your giving. While you're doing that, I'll remind you real quickly that we have uh, sign-ups for the couples conference coming up just a few weeks. Everything's going so fast. You know, we only have seven Sundays left in 2023. Seven Sundays left. That's crazy to me. That is crazy to me. It's gone by like a, like a blink of an eye. Um, 
We're going to receive our boxes offering as well if you need envelopes or things for that if you weren't prepared. Usually toward the beginning of each month, we do a second offering for these areas of ministry that are not covered by the church budget. These are covered exclusively by what you do, what you feel God has called you to do. We've got world missions, which we've got things. There's a door opening uh, for, for us to go to Romania the end of February. That's a, a need there. Uh, we've got the building is, we're, we're doing the furnishings and all that stuff. Still need your help. But I want to focus this month on Heart Smile Foundation. This is the humanitarian arm of our church. And during the holidays, Pastor Gail and the team, they do so many projects and things, but they can only do with the resources that they're entrusted with. We are believing God. We're trusting God. Uh, one of the big things they do is every year, uh, and it started my wife's heart, uh, when we first started the church, she takes the children of single parent families, single moms, single dads that are in the core of the body, and she gets those kids and they try to take them out shopping and do things for the kids and then have the kids do things for their parents. And that's a big thing they want to do again this year. And so that would be helpful. We've got uh, the tree coming up, uh, sponsoring. Something's coming up in a few weeks as well, right? But you can do something today. Pay, we're partnering with Pay It Forward Outreach again this year to help uh, community-wide uh, uh, children in families where there's people incarcerated or different things like that. That'll come up another time. But we need your help today in Heart Smile Foundation. That's a big thing. So I want you to just pray about it and do, do it as the Lord blesses. You can do it online. You don't have to come up to the front. But we'd love for you to put something in here and just be in agreement with us to pray for these areas as we finish this year strong in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for blessing the people with abundance. Lord, I thank you for that windfall. Those those big things. I thank you, Lord, that every business person that is owed money in their business, if you're a business owner and you're owed money by clients who have been dragging their feet or whatever it is, put your hands in front of you right now. In Jesus' name, I pray for every business owner, every person who works on commissions or sales, depending on end of your bonuses or provisions. And I speak blessing over the work of your hands, Greg. I speak blessing over the work of your hands, Amanda. I speak blessing over the work of your hands, anyone who's in business right now. And I prophesy abundance as you finish this year. Trust your Father to get the word out, to put a, 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 a hook in those people, to, to do what they're supposed to do and to pay you what they owe you. In Jesus' name, Lord, let it be accelerated. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please come up when you can. Friday, uh, Wednesday night, prayer school. I want to encourage you to come. And then prayer school is coming up. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. See you Wednesday night if you can be here. Thanks for joining us at Now Church. For the latest updates, visit us at nowchurch.com, including live or on-demand video, event registration, online giving, and much more. And don't forget to follow Now Church on our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please use the hashtag NowChurch. Thank you.